on the planning committee for the Houston Regional Pug. Today's event is our final meeting for 2021, and we have bought some great speakers for you all. Uh, as some of you may already know, the Pug has been around since 1990 with chapters in the United States and Europe. Uh, the Houston chapter was founded in 2013 and has grown considerably since its inception. Our intent is to continue to support the Pug community with more events that, to pr that promote the exchange of geospatial technologies and meeting of like-minded people like you who have come today. We have four events a year with a social usually in January to kick off the new year, followed by three quarterly meetings for the remainder of the year. And now I wanted to let you all know that the Pug will be undergoing an exciting new change, which I know all of you will be very excited to hear about. There will be an official announcement tomorrow on the Pug LinkedIn page, so stay tuned. We will give you that link uh, in the chat room uh, as we go through, so if you wanna check it out later, that'll be great. Before we begin, I'd like to say thank you to ESRI for providing the venue and for being our sponsor for this event. I also wanted to say thank you to our speakers for making the huge commitment and effort to put the time in and bring their talks to us today. Finally, we will have time for one or two questions at the end of each talk. If you have any questions for the speakers, please wait till the speakers have finished. In the meantime, please make sure you stay muted during the presentations. We will also provide contact information in a follow-up email for all the speakers in case you have any more questions for them or would like to contact them. So our first speaker, is Scott Nullis with ESRI. Scott will be giving a talk on web GIS updates, ArcGIS online map viewer and services based editing. Scott is a solution engineer on the natural resources team at ESRI based here in Houston. Scott works with organizations across the energy sector to help solve problems with GIS and geospatial technology. His interests and focus include mapping and visualization, field mobility, routing and logistics, and imagery. Prior to joining ESRI, Scott worked as a GIS analyst for Diamondback Energy in Midland, Texas. Scott? All right, I'll flip on my camera. Thanks, Phil, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Appreciate you taking a little bit of your time uh, out of your day. And just like Phil said, I'm here to talk to you about uh, some enhancements, some recent enhancements with ArcGIS Online and just the overall pattern of, of WebGIS. So I've started sharing my screen, kind of get some confirmation that, that people are seeing it. Yep, we can see All it. Right. Fantastic. Uh, so what we've heard from the community and, and you all, um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of changes with some of the, the features and, and enhancements in, in ArcGIS Online and some of the other parts of, of the ArcGIS system. So I wanna give a, a good overview of, of where some of the new enhancements are at in terms of, uh, of status, uh, mainly focusing on ArcGIS Online and the, the new map viewer. If many of you are working in that platform, you, you might be aware that there's been a new map viewer that was introduced, uh, as well as this kind of new pattern of what we refer to as services-based editing. So uh, being able to uh, reach more people in the organization or support more people with editing workflows in a non-traditional format. So we'll get into the, the details of that uh, here in a little bit. So as far as an agenda, we're gonna start by looking at the ArcGIS Online Map Viewer, and we're gonna really uncover the options that you have today um, at your disposal. We're gonna compare the difference between this new map viewer and the old map viewer or map viewer classic. And then we're gonna do a, a quick little demo of the, uh, the differences. As you can see, my story map here is updating. Let me just close that out right here. And this is actually something we'll talk about. All right, going back up to the top here. Uh, after that, we're gonna get into WebGIS editing patterns, uh, really focused on this idea of services-based editing. So starting with ArcGIS Online, uh, many of you know the, the map viewer functionality available within ArcGIS Online, also available within your enterprise portal. It's the primary tool for authoring and configuring web maps, uh, exploring data that's been shared or uploaded 
uh, into your portal and performing analysis. Now, recently we've of course added a new option uh, with some new enhancements and functionality specifically in ArcGIS Online. So today as it stands, you've really got two options when working with Map Viewer. On the left, we see the Map Viewer Classic or the original Map Viewer. And then on the right, we see the same exact map opened up in the new Map Viewer or what was formerly known as the Map Viewer Beta. And you can see there's a, a lot of similarities, but uh, overall, there's there's a, a difference in experience and functionality with the new map viewer that we'll uh, we'll get into uh, briefly here in a minute. So a little more background on the classic map viewer uh, really provides a classic look uh, look and feel to your traditional GIS workflows. Uh, it's got traditional tools and capabilities in terms of being able to perform edits and analysis. Uh, and it's really built on a JavaScript three code base. And that's important when we start talking about the differences uh, between the old and, and new. Uh, down here, I've, I've actually embedded a view uh, of a map within the old map viewer. And if you aren't familiar with uh, what this looks like, right? It's, it's just a, an interface for configuring and adding maps. So I've got a, a standard kind of asset overview map that we've uh, configured here where we've got some operating areas, prospect areas, leasehold, you know, I can zoom in, have additional information pop on like well locations, maybe a land grid, uh, you know, surface assets, wells, pads, facilities, uh, pipelines, things that you're all familiar with, right? And I've got some, some familiar tools in here for working with all of these different layers. Of course, I can configure what layers are showing, right? I can add new content to my map. If any of my layers are editable in this map, I can edit them here directly within the map viewer. And then I have options to, you know, toggle on the base map, perform some analysis. If I want to do things like, you know, a buffer analysis or do some data enrichment or summarization. And then I've got a bunch of other standard tools for just managing the overall look and feel of the map. So a lot of you from are familiar with this, but when we start talking about the new map viewer, there's some stark kind of differences in, in contrast. So scrolling down to the new map viewer, um, it, it really looks a lot different than, than what you may be used to. So it's really focused on this interactive user experience and it's built from the ground up using a brand new code base, which is the JavaScript for code base. And what that allows us to do is add some additional functionality and enhancements that weren't possible in the old map viewer. So things like being able to group layers, that's a huge request that a lot of users were asking for. You can do that using the new map viewer and the JavaScript for uh, base. There's a lot of visualization capabilities that you now have access to that you couldn't do in the old map viewer. So we're still working on pairing some capabilities over from the uh, older map viewer or the classic map viewer. And, and we'll get to the differences here in just a sec. But if you haven't seen the new map viewer, I've got a, a quick little tutorial of what it looks like. Uh, so if you open this up in ArcGIS Online, right, this is kind of what you'll see. I've got the same exact map added here, and it's really a lot more contextual than the old map viewer. So if you're familiar with ArcGIS Pro, uh, with the contextual kind of ribbons and tabs and, and panes that pop up, this new map viewer has a, a very similar experience, right? I've got all of my kind of controls over here on the left. So I have the ability to look at all of my layers here in the map and I can toggle on and off those different layers as well as configure things about those layers like the transparency, visibility, all that good stuff. Uh, I can have the same options to change my base map, right? For all of the uh, similar base map galleries and, and things that you can link to in here. And then I've got the ability to do things like create charts, which is a totally new capability that was not possible in the old map viewer. And you can start to understand and, and visualize your data in a different way using charts based on uh, things, attributes in your data that you wanna be able to compare or visualize. Uh, and then you've got your standard tools, right? For uh, sharing and saving your app, you know, printing, creating a, an app from your web map. But if we go back to our layer list, there's a lot more kind of hidden functionality in this new map viewer. So if I click on a layer, what I'll get over here on the right side are all of the properties and settings and configuration of that specific layer. 
So as I click different layers, right, I'll have these contextual tabs open up on the side where I can do things like view all the properties of my map. Like I said, set things like transparency, visibility, enable editing, um, a new cool functionality is this idea of layer blending. Uh, so if you've got multiple layers and you don't want to mess around with the transparency, you can actually blend them cartographically to create much more vibrant uh, visualizations, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then I've got the ability, obviously, to style my map, uh, layer, filter, right? configure pop-ups, fields, labels. So a lot of the same functionality, but again, a lot of new capabilities as well based on that new kind of JavaScript uh, 4.x base code. So scrolling down a little bit, we can talk, talk about some of the differences in, in comparison between the two map viewers. Uh, so the first one is, which one do I use, right? So as a ArcGIS Online user, you have access to both map viewers. Now there's gonna be a default that your organization administrator sets for the organization. So when you go to the item details page of a web map, or if you click on the, the map tab within ArcGIS Online, that default option is gonna open up automatically. But members can set a different default option for their specific account. So if you don't like the option that your administrator has set, you can actually go into your profile and override that. Now, web maps authored in both environments are available to consume in both the new and old map viewers. So there, there's this idea of both backwards and forwards uh, compatibility. So uh, let's say you took a, a map that was previously created in Map Viewer Classic. You can actually open that up right off the bat in the new Map Viewer. And you can take advantage of some of the new functionality like grouping layers, doing layer blending charts, all without having to recreate the map, right? You just save it as a new map, it updates to the new code base and you're good to go from there. Same idea, if you open up a map in the new map viewer and you author a map in the new map viewer and you wanna open it up in the old map viewer, you can do that, but just be aware that there's gonna be some functionality differences and you'll actually get a warning sign just like we saw a few minutes ago in the, the classic map viewer that, hey, you've got some layers in your map that have been configured and only the new map viewer support, supports that configuration, but overall uh, your capabilities and, and just basic visualization and, and mapping, uh, you're gonna be able to go between the two as you please. So the, the thing that everyone wants to know, right, is, is what's different between the two. So there's a number of different things that either aren't yet supported or are only gonna be supported in the new map viewer. So these are broken down into a couple of different categories. So we have kind of a common workflows category and a lot of these things that you can do in the, the uh, classic map viewer, like add a layer from file, perform analysis, add layer from URL. There's some limitations or um, you know, lack of support for, for some of those items right now. So the biggest one is probably this idea of analysis. If you wanna be able to perform hosted analysis within the map viewer and ArcGIS Online, your only option right now is to use the classic map viewer. So our, our dev team is, is still working on integrating some of the capabilities into, into the new map viewer. But since it was designed from the ground up on a different code base, they kind of have to start from scratch on a lot of that stuff. So that's why some of these things aren't yet available, mainly the analysis. But again, any results of the analysis that you do, you could definitely open up in the new map viewer and, uh, and add to your map and visualize. Some different layer types. Um, you know, obviously you can add a bunch of different layer types to both the classic and new versions of Map Viewer, but there are some limitations around configuring those different layer types and doing things like uh, setting, you know, the styles and uh, the filtering and processing uh, options for a bunch of those layers. So mainly imagery layers, vector tile layers, uh, feature collections, and streaming feature layers, there are, there are limitations around those. Traditional feature layers, either hosted or coming from an ArcGIS server, in addition to map image layers, all of those are fully supported right now. So you can configure the, the styles, filters, pop-ups, all of that good stuff for those more traditional layers. Going down to mapping capabilities, um, there are a few things that haven't yet been ported over again. Uh, the idea of configuring Kind of related records within a pop-up of a feature layer uh, is, is not currently supported. Again, that's something I believe is on the roadmap. Uh, when you're editing the symbology for point symbols, you have a limited gallery of symbols to choose from, but you can expect that to continue to be built out over time. 
And then there's uh, some limitations around the idea of performing interactive filtering and using feature templates to create and modify features in the new Map Viewer. Again, all of those things are still fully supported uh, with the Map Viewer Classic. Now you might be saying, when do I need to make the switch to Map Viewer? Is Map Viewer Classic going away? There's been no definitive uh, stance that we're taking in, in terms of removing the Map Viewer Classic from your uh, ArcGIS Online organization. So at this point in time, you're gonna be able to use both. Uh, it's not gonna be deprecated anytime soon, um, but feel free just to use either the, the Classic Viewer or the new Map Viewer Classic, uh, sorry, Classic Viewer or the new Map Viewer as uh, your workflows uh, kind of require. To note, editing is now supported in the new Map Viewer. So that was something that, again, didn't come until the most recent release of ArcGIS Online uh, a couple months ago. Uh, for, for a while, you can only do edits in the, the classic version of the Map Viewer, but this new Map Viewer now supports editing, which is fantastic. And we'll, we'll look at that here in a minute. Uh, so I've got a link in here that, that we can share out, just part of the documentation that, that links out to the specific um, capabilities, what's supported, what's not, uh, if you guys are interested in, in looking at that uh, a little further. So with the idea of the, the map viewer and kind of the differences and what's available there kind of uh, behind us now, let's take a, a look at this kind of in action and how we can use these different things. And we're gonna do this through the lens of this idea of services-based editing. So services-based editing is, is this new kind of approach for managing and editing your authoritative information. And it leverages this services-based architecture instead of direct database connections. So for those of you that have enterprise geodatabases or um, file geodatabases, you know, typically if a, if a user wants to make changes to the data in those environments, they have to direct connect to those, those databases, be on your network, be a user in the, the database management system. And there's a lot of overhead there for managing. This new kind of idea, paradigm shift of services-based editing allows you to build on top of that and extend a bunch of these capabilities without a bunch of the overhead and, uh, and management that's required. So specifically, I've got this little graphic here that kind of outlines the conceptual overview of this. So you've got your source data here sitting in a file geodatabase, enterprise geodatabase, shapefile, whatever your source information is. You publish this as a web layer to either ArcGIS Online or your enterprise portal. And then that web service becomes accessible to a bunch of different client applications. You could pull that web service back down into your desktop application like ArcGIS Pro and work with it as if it were a local feature class in a geo database. You can perform edits on it. You can add it to geo processing tools and do analysis with it. And you can pull that same web service into a web application and you can visualize it or even edit it through a web app, like a web app builder, visualize it through a dashboard or something like that. You can also connect to these web services through our mobile applications. So if you have workers in the field that need to perform edits, collect new information, they can use these native mobile apps to connect to this portal online environment, uh, work with the data natively, and then update that information that can then be accessible, made directly accessible to the rest of the users through these other types of client applications. So it's, it's a completely new kind of paradigm shift that allows you to, to really embrace this idea of web GIS across your organization. And some of the benefits to doing this is it's very performant. Uh, so what we're seeing right now, in a lot of cases, if, uh, if you've got your database sitting in one location and you've got your enterprise, your ArcGIS Online sitting in, in another location, sorry about that, drop something, um, there can be some lags some latency in terms of updating and accessing the data. Accessing the information through web services instead of a direct database connection can help reduce some of that lag and latency. It's also very flexible. As I just mentioned, right, you have a, a variety of options for how you can consume these, uh, these data sets and work with them. You don't necessarily have to be in an application that only connects to a relational database or an enterprise or file geo database. And it, and it uh, allows for that more seamless connection, right? So like I said, any, Changes or edits made by one person uh, are directly uh, accessible to all of the other people in the organization based on how the layer and the uh, whole system has been configured. So let's take a quick look at this. I know running a little short on time, but 
I want to see, I want to kind of show you how this, this works in action. So I'm going to minimize a bunch of this stuff right here, drag over pro and show you how this will work in just a few minutes. So I've got here within ArcGIS Pro, a basic point layer. And this point layer is stored in a file geodatabase on my local machine. If I want to edit the data in this file geodatabase in this point layer, I'm going to have to add this feature class to a map in ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap. Uh, and then I'm going to need to, to use that client application to, to work with the data. What we want to do sure instead is make it accessible to everyone else in our organization, right? So through the, the virtue of being able to publish this layer to our connected web GIS, I can do that and make it accessible in the services-based format. So I've signed into one of our ArcGIS Online organizations up here. I've already configured my layer. So I'm just going to go ahead and click publish. What this is going to do on the back end is it's going to take this data, it's going to push it up to, in this case, the Edgely Cloud and make it accessible in a standardized format. Same idea uh, could happen if you've got an enterprise in an ArcGIS server configuration. You could actually register or reference this data set and then make it accessible through a registered web service as well. Same idea, same, uh, same functionality both ways, uh, but it allows users to access this information without necessarily needing to connect directly to that database. So while that's finishing, I'm gonna minimize this and we're going to open up our browser and we're gonna look at uh, kind of what this looks like. So if I open up that map viewer that we just looked at, I'm gonna add this layer that was just published here. So we're gonna come in here, we're gonna add a layer. I'm gonna search, it goes to my content by default, there it is. And it's gonna come in just like it looked there within ArcGIS Pro. So we're gonna see the same, um, same symbology, right? All of the same features, same data behind the features. Uh, but once it's in this environment, we can configure it a little further uh, to work with it. It's loading, sorry, it's being a little slow. All right, let's zoom into this area real quick. And we can see we've got some wells here. I could add additional layers like leases and other layers for reference. But in this case, what we wanna be able to do is edit this layer, not only from our desktop application, but from the web. So we might have different people in the organization that manage maybe different parts of this data set or wanna be able to, to make updates and changes as information uh, changes over time. So we wanna be able to support that. Since this layer has been enabled with the editing capability, I can actually come in here and work with it directly. So if we come in here and just update the style real quick, we wanna show well status. So I'm gonna go ahead and just quickly symbolize on that. And this shows us, we go to our legend over here, what each well is, right? So we see a bunch of active wells, we see some inactive, maybe uh, shut-in wells, maybe some PNA. I see one down here, it's, it's unknown. The status of this well is unknown. And we wanna be able to change that, right? So I can come in here and click on this layer and see all of the information associated with it. And since this layer has been set up for editing, I can come down here and actually edit this feature. So if I click edit and then select that feature, I get all of the editable fields within this layer. I can come in here and actually update this to active if that's what it is. When I update this, that layer is gonna be changed. Now, if we go back to ArcGIS Pro, if I drag my screen over, we see if we select that same feature here in the map and look at our attributes, we see that this still says unknown. And the reason for that is because we're still accessing our local geodatabase feature class. In order to get the new information, right, what we want to do is connect to our new published layer through our portal and add that to the map. So here's that same layer. I can just drag this over into my map. I can see it comes in as a web service instead of a geodatabase feature class. But since Pro is configured to work with WebGIS in a connected format, we can natively work with this just as if it were a local geodatabase feature class. So if I turn this one off real quick and then highlight this again, turn that off, attributes. Oh, I think I turned the wrong one off. All right, there we go. Mm, what's it doing here? Oh, there we go. Let's refresh. 
there we go. Now it says active. So we're con now connecting to that published layer that we've made accessible through ArcGIS Online, pulled that back down into Pro, and now we're working with that as our new kind of authoritative data layer. Now let's say as a GIS analyst, I need to go and update this layer again. I can go ahead and select that here within my, my attributes pane. I can update the status of that well, come in here and click save my edits. And what that's gonna do is make this accessible now back in the map viewer. So you see it's red right now. If I zoom out, that changes to blue. If we click on that, we can see it's now been changed to inactive. So this editing works in pretty much real time. As long as I'm connected, I'm gonna be able to see that status update. And this is a great way to collaborate across different groups or different people in the organization and be able to work off the same authoritative information, but keep it up to date based on the information that you have in your organization. And this is a very simple example, right? But you can uh, you know, scale this out and apply it over many of your authoritative data sets that you publish to this online environment and make it accessible to people across your organization. So I'd be happy to you know, follow up with anyone that wants some more information about uh, kind of how this, this process is set up or you know, any, any further details or complexities that you guys are thinking of. You know, we're happy to, to follow up and have that discussion. But for this, I think we're you know, probably a little over my time, but uh, I'll go ahead and toss it back over to Phil so we can uh, get some of these other presenters um, going. Thanks, Scott. Um, Tiffany, I'll toss okay. it back to Tiffany. I'm just gonna throw myself out there because we did get some questions for you. And I don't know if you can see them in the chat box or not. Um, but I uh, Yeah, it was hidden, but I can see them. Yes, so there are a couple questions and if you're able to kind of quickly touch on them, I think we have from Alina, Allen, and Stephanie. Yeah, let's see, Alina says, can you publish a web viewer map as a web app and still have the group layer option? And then I see another question from Stephanie that kind of hits on the same thing. Um, so it, it depends, right? If you configure a map in the new map viewer and you save that map and, and share it as let's say a web app builder application, you're not gonna have the same functionality available. And the reason for that is that the new map viewer is built on a different code base than web app builder. Web app builder is the, the JavaScript three version, New map viewer is JavaScript 4. So although you can configure some of the, the new functionality in the map itself, those new features aren't going to be available in Web App Builder because it's just a completely different web um, code base. And what you might be able to do is use a new uh, newer tool like Experience Builder, which is built on the JavaScript 4 code base that will uh, inherit and honor some of these new settings like the group layers and other things that you can do in the map viewer. So it's just something to be cognizant of. And one more question, because I know we're out of time, but Sarah has asked a question. We'll be able to see the legend of vector tiles in a new map viewer in 2022. Uh, that's a good question. I don't have all of the roadmap, um, you know, off the top of my head. I don't know what's included, going to be included in the near term, midterm, and long term roadmaps. But that's something that we can uh, follow up with you on uh, once we get that information from the product development team. All right. Scott, that was awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. That was actually uh, very, very interesting. I like the way you did the side-by-side -side comparison uh, between the two, uh, the legacy and the current map product. Um, so yes, appreciate your time. And uh, anybody else have any questions, uh, send them to us at Houston at pugonline.org. Uh, yeah. or we will be furnishing uh, <clears throat> Scott's email uh, in an email later tonight if you want to contact him directly. Um, so our next speakers are Todd Buhlman and Orlando McDowell with Logic Solutions Group. They're doing our very first renewables talk on how renewables companies are using enterprise GIS to drive business. Todd has been has 20 years experience in the leadership, sales engineering, development and delivery of world-class business and software solutions within a variety of vert vertical industries focused on the energy sector, Microsoft-based technologies and geographic information systems. 
Orlando is a GIS architect and leader with over 20 years experience in designing, developing, and implementing enterprise GIS solutions in the energy and local government sectors. Todd? Great. Uh, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Fantastic. All right, let me share my screen. One second, sorry guys, technical difficulties. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction as, as well, Phil. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in then because we've been introduced. Um, I, I, I did also want to mention that we have um, our client on the phone as well, but I'll introduce him here in just a moment. Um, but we're talking about a, a project that we did with Invenergy. We've actually been engaged with them for a number of years now. Um, through uh, multiple different projects and efforts, and we're going to just walk through those briefly. Invenergy, um, I'll, I'll let uh, David introduce them in a moment on another slide, but they are a renewables company um, out of Chicago. So we're going to talk about how it's driving business, and I'm going to kind of close with how um, GIS can, can help um, uh, renewables companies in many ways. We're focusing today on really business applications of enterprise GIS. So, um, David Treering is from Invenergy. He's senior manager of GIS applications. Um, so he will be taking a number of these slides today. Thank you, David, for joining. Uh, we're gonna talk about the business case for, for enterprise GIS. We're gonna talk about four components for that. Um, and then we're gonna just talk about business impact of these applications and, and quick takeaways. So quickly, who is Logic? Um, we're a uh, GIS enterprise services company here in Houston, Texas. And uh, we focus on a number of things, everything from GIS strategy to building out custom applications um, and ETL. And that's not supposed to be going ahead. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to go in this mode just so that way it doesn't <laughs> forward on me automatically, um, which it magically does every once in a while. Um, but fit for pur purpose solutions in the enterprise GIS space um, and integration with business solutions. Um, so this is uh, who we are here in Logic, most of, or in Houston, Texas. Most of you guys know Logic, hopefully. Um, and moving on, so working with Invenergy, um, I was going to ask if David could, can take this slide and talk a little bit about Invenergy, and then the next slide, which is the business case. Certainly. Thank you, Todd. David, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. So Invenergy is one of the leading privately held uh, developers of and operators of renewable energy solutions globally. We've developed over uh, 188 projects in operations across four continents and have uh, continued to develop long lasting partnerships with a, a broad range of institutions, utilities, and businesses. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so we began this process um, about four years ago as the company was experiencing some exponential growth. And as you can imagine, with a young company, we had a number of uh, disparate processes and mechanisms that had been developed throughout the uh, renewable energy development life cycle. Uh, this included prospecting and greenfield siting, uh, landowner contacts and negotiations on the way to signing leases, property title and curative tracking, engineering design of uh, facility layouts, and more. So we chose to build out a brand new tool that would address all of the above and move us forward uh, with everybody on the same page. We, we chose Logic Solutions to partner with us for their GIS expertise, demonstrated successes with uh, web app builder customizations and uh, Microsoft application development experience. The business case for, for developing this application uh, really came from a number of uh, pain points that we were experiencing, uh, partly due to exponential growth and partly just due to um, 
the state of our GIS system itself. So we first wanted to first wanted to streamline our uh, data collection and data moving up and down the hierarchy was involved in, in multiple steps and those were associated with time delays that were just unacceptable. Um, also on the GIS side, we were responsible for um, loading land parcel data uh, for a number of different tasks. And that was far too time consuming, um, having to receive an order, uh, contact a vendor, uh, or find the data, download it, and contact the, the developer. Um, it was all just a bunch of bottlenecks. Um, the next bigger big point is the single source of truth was lacking. Um, you know, we, we had uh, meetings where people were bringing in paper maps uh, of different vintages, you know, just days apart could have uh, different data on the maps and it was uh, leading to confusion and, and uh, frustration in really identifying what the current state of things was. Um, the next big thing was our ArcGIS. We were on an older version of ArcGIS, working with um, ArcGIS Online, and we wanted to migrate to a more secure in-house version with Enterprise. Um, Logic really helped us to scope the Enterprise uh, appropriately for the number of machines and instances that we would need, uh, helped us build it out, and then optimize performance. So I'll hand it off here to, to Todd and Orlando to show the various aspects of our work together. Thank you so much, David. Great. So, um, so first it was GIS Foundation. So uh, we went in and, and everything that, that David was saying is we migrated into an Azure um, space with, we now have a development staging and production servers. Um, we, we were, we integrated with Okta Security, which was, um, uh, a pretty big deal inside of Azure as well. So there was just a lot of moving parts there. Um, we built out a number of custom widgets to help with the business um, and support what they needed to do. Um, we, we did a bunch of performance tuning in Azure as well because we were dealing with millions and millions of parcel records. Um, so just trying to make sure that that all worked um, and was secure. Um, and then of course, we, we did a lot with um, Azure Application Insights to make sure that we were achieving our goals there. Um, and we had full uh, automated pipelines for DevOps as well. So that was laying the foundation. Um, then we worked in a, a, a core data aspect. I'm going to hand that off to Orlando. So in terms of core data, I just wanted to kind of go back to how some of these things were accomplished. Um, like Todd said, we did build some custom widgets. That's all built on using the JavaScript 3 API and using Web App Builder and then extending it with custom widgets. But in addition to the custom widgets, that gave us the flexibility for Invenergy to incorporate the standard widgets as well and to use the ability to set the pop-ups in the map configuration in a web map and to be able to switch out web maps for different applications. So that was what the, the, app, the application is built on. And then in order to do the core data, some of the tasks that David mentioned, like getting parcel data into the system, we're doing a bunch of different things. Uh, so one is that we're taking advantage of the feature-based edit, the service-based editing that Scott was talking about earlier. So that in some of these web apps, we can actually do the web editing there instead of relying on users who have desktops and also custom geoprocessing services to do some of the backend tasks. And those are published ArcGIS server and then consumed in the widgets. But one of the key functions is to be able to create a project. So that's done using editing in a web map. And then it also will call some services to validate, go to the back end, the user can say, okay, now I'm ready to get the parcels and call that, that custom service that'll go out and pull the parcels that intersect that project boundary. Um, after that, um, the land developer can go in and track his project, set statuses, and do other edits through the web map through additional widgets. And those all go back to the services, update so that the map will update in real time whenever they've made a status change. Um, we also created a custom widget. Um, one of the kind of 
issues that came across from having so many widgets is that the widgets weren't really cohesive. Uh, so we built a new widget called a Universal Project Selector. And what that does is enable um, a developer to, to select either using a search or on the map a particular project and then all of the associated widgets will get information about what projects are loaded and they'll automatically load the information about that project. So as you're moving to widget to widget, it's a cohesive experience like a fully developed app, even though they are widgets. Um, just to get to some of the other functions though, is that you can, the land developer can assign a land agent. And once that land agent is assigned through a widget, then it becomes, available in the second app that we have, which is our field data collection app. So in the field data collection app, it has some security built in using ArcGIS portal groups so that the land agents can only access specific information. As a matter of fact, the land agents can't even like browse portal. Um, there are some URL rewrite rules in place so that they can only access the land agent app. Once they get into the app, there's a series of filters based on their username and their RTS portal group that'll go down and filter the exact parcels and projects that they're allowed to see. Um, and the two apps are separate apps, even though because it's widget based, we can share some of those widgets between the apps and share some of that custom code that we've written, but they're actually two separate apps in order to facilitate that security between land agent and land developers. Very nice, thank you. So the fourth um, uh, project that, we, that we've done uh, with Invenergy um, was around our curative process tracker. Um, and this was really a, uh, a pure application development um, type of um, exercise, but it has a read-write mechanism, uh, mechanism to the Enterprise GIS, um, which is reading and writing statuses back and forth for color coding in the map. And believe it or not, this is much more complicated than you might think. Um, there are multiple um, parts or uh, projects can overlap. So you can have parcels um, with different statuses based upon different projects. So the ability to kind of manage that and do that right um, was, was quite a bit of work. Um, we did use Angular Prime NG for, for the, uh, the curative application development um, and then web services to connect back to um, the enterprise GIS. So business impact, um, I can hand this back to you, David, and, and, uh, and then we'll do the takeaway slides and, and uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Todd. So we've been able to accomplish a, a lot of what we set out to do, uh, streamlining and centralizing our data collection tools. So now everybody who's uh, investigating a project, meeting about uh, current project, status updates is able to simply pull up uh, our application rather than uh, relying on paper maps, relying on uh, disparate spreadsheets um, that may be shared amongst a group, but uh, we're just not, not okay. adequate. Um, so we have a single source of truth now uh, where management is able to uh, confidently understand the, the current status of everything from landowner communications to uh, signing of leases to uh, title orders and uh, clearing of, of curatives on on leases so uh, we are very pleased with our application we continue to uh, brainstorm new uh, innovative uses and include more of our uh, users within the company and various different business units uh, in this application one of the greatest parts about this is just the uh, the spread of uh, GIS savvy and knowledge uh, and use within the company. Having a reliable, stable platform uh, where we can serve huge data sets uh, has really increased the confidence throughout the company in our ability to, to uh, not only innovate these ideas of what might be feasible, but also to deliver solutions that people can can actually use at their desk. Um, so we've expanded to to many other groups that we hadn't even envisioned participating with uh, since we've implemented the, the upgrades to our system. Uh, so we're very pleased and, and look forward to continuing uh, development on this project and with Logic Solutions. Thank you so much, David. 
Um, I just realized that some people may not um, know what a curative is because I don't think I really did until we kicked off this project. But imagine when you go to sell your house that um, you need to check that there's no liens on your house and things like that. And that's actually a really big deal if you're buying and selling uh, tracts of land uh, out in the field. Um, you have to go through that legal process. So that's what the curative tracker was. Sorry for skipping over that. Um, just a couple of quick takeaways um, from my perspective. Um, GIS analysis and enterprise GIS um, are kind of two, two, have been two separate things. Um, like, for instance, site selection, which the next talk is going to be about, um, is oftentimes thought of as a desktop tool where you're using Pro um, to, to do analysis and, and where you're going to put, um, for instance, the um, uh, solar panels to get the you know, maximum sunlight. Um, and that's all true. Um, and then Enterprise GIS we just talked about was more about driving business, right? So we were using Enterprise GIS to solve business problems and field communication and all that. But really, though, those are starting to blend or to ha have already blended to a large degree. Um, and so we do think that there's going to be more and more of that kind of site selection or analysis side that's going to be blended in over time with Invenergy. We're excited about doing that. Um, but, but just wanted to point out that there's kind of a difference there in um, the kind of more analytical side and the business application side um, from our perspective. Um, and uh, that leads into GIS as aggregator and integrator for these di different data sets um, so that way people can make decisions. Um, lastly, just the, it may be very obvious um, to the folks on the phone, but um, it, it, was, it became very clear to us early on that the renewable space is just very, very similar to surface-based oil and gas workflows. Um, there's a lot of the same stuff going on. So, um, and, you know, when it comes to leasing, of course, um, but also, um, you know, tying into, uh, uh, instead of it being a pipeline, you're tying into um, electrical lines and trying to get your energy to market. Um, it's, it's just very much very similar to, um, to a lot of the oil and gas space. So for those of you that are uh, maybe uh, nervous about the future with, uh, with changes going on in our industry, um, you shouldn't be, because I think that there's just going to be so much, of, uh, so much similar work you know, that's going to be going on. And with that, we'll wrap it up and hand it back to you, Phil. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone. And thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Todd and Orlando and David. We have a couple of questions for you. I don't know if you're able to uh, see them. Oh, it looks like David actually responded to it in the chat box. Um, but there was a question on version um, web editing with branch um, enabled in the enterprise geodatabase. Um, and David responded that we're not currently using uh, branch versioning. And then there's another question on here. Um, where have you used, I guess, uh, the, uh, where have you used in the business applications? Um, Robbie, I don't know if you wanna, I don't know if the question is asking like what this um, units are using these applications or if you're trying to maybe understand how it's been received by the business. If you can unmute yourself, you can clarify the question. I'm sure these gentlemen will be happy to respond. Uh -huh. um, so for, for site selection, uh, I mean, that, that, uh, the, the next speakers are actually going to talk about site selection, I think, in a, a bit of a different context. But um, there's some great tools uh, that, uh, on, that I've seen uh, Renewables um, uh, videos on for actually, you know, doing angle of sun and, and, and time of year or season um, to figure out how much uh, sunlight you can get, for instance. That's just one example of how you would use maybe Pro to, to do some some hardcore analysis to figure out the best placement of your uh, uh, of your uh, renewables assets. Um, do you have any feedback on that, David? Maybe how um, are, are 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 you guys using GIS for site selection today, specifically um, on the analytical side of things? Certainly, yes. We we. Uh, uh, intake a whole range of different parameters uh, at various scales. It includes different uh, different types of layers. Um, so you want to start at the the largest uh, area of prospecting and identify different areas. That includes some layers, um, which includes like you're talking about the wind and solar resource maps that are available. Um, but as you as you get down to identify things like uh, soil types and, and suitability at uh, very fine grain level. Um, it includes 
you know, things like uh, environmental constraints and and uh, particular ownership and and things. It's it's really fascinating to to try to um, preempt uh, so much of the work that goes into site selection um, and and make those those cutoffs and exclude unsuitable land before uh, so much time and effort and money has been spent exploring them. Wow, I imagine. Well, very cool. Um, thanks again, Tiffany. Um, I think that was all the questions uh, and we're basically at time. So again, our pleasure and, and thank you so much everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Todd, Orlando, and thanks, David. Back to you, Phil. Great, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a very, very uh, impressive talk, uh, especially like the way you guys uh, uh, did the initial business case before and after scenarios. Um, that was really, really uh, useful to understand how much ground was gained uh, in the process. Um, so guys, thank you again for your talk. And uh, our next and final speakers are Tasha Jackson and Aaron Helton with Resource Data. They're doing a talk on strategic resource planning and site selection tool in ArcGIS Pro. Tasha is a senior project manager and senior business analyst at Resource Data with over 12 years experience doing ESRI-based GIS projects for oil and gas companies in Alaska. Her GIS experience ranges from asset integrity and engineering change management to full cloud-based ESRI enterprise implementations. As a skilled business analyst with a strategic planning background, Tasha is capable of identifying requirements, designing solutions, and managing implementation teams through the full project life cycle. Aaron has been working with GIS for 12 years in environmental, cultural, and energy industries. Her past work includes predictive modeling, LIDAR collection and processing, 3D visualization, data management, web map development, and automating workflows. Aaron's more recent projects have been focused on compliance reporting and emergency response. Last year, Aaron was featured on three episodes of History Channel's The Curse of Oak Island, where she used historic maps, enhanced LIDAR data, and triangulation techniques to determine the original positions of lost features. Tasha? Hello. We hear you. In, can you hear me? Great. Thanks for the introduction. So and today- we can, we can see your screen too. You can so. see my screen? Yep. Excellent. All right, so the purpose of our presentation today is to talk about a tool that we created for one of our clients. And uh, the purpose of the tool is to be used for strategic site selection. And um, the tool basically can be used to identify locations best suited for the specific needs of the user. It identifies the least cumulative cost for all locations within an area of interest. And the cost is determined by user provided factors for site selection suitability. To come up with the approach for how to do the site selection, we did a number of literature review studies and worked with various stakeholders to identify the approach for decision making. So the tool, which is a toolbox with many different tools in it, includes multi-criteria decision-making analysis, weighted decision analysis, cost surface analysis, and least cost path. So simply put, it creates an image where the green is good and the red is bad based on what the business users and subject matter experts consider to be good and bad placement for their need. The background is that we created the tool for the Alaska Department of Natural Resources ASTAR project, that's the Arctic Strategic Transportation and Resources project. And we did a number of products for this project. Um, one of them was project prioritization using um, analytical hierarchy process for all of the communities across the North Slope of Alaska. 
And the focus was on infrastructure projects and identifying those projects that provided the most value to the communities. Once that was done, we came up with several large scale projects for connecting communities and encouraging economic development across the communities. And we decided to, to create a tool to automate doing site selection analysis for those projects that were selected. The tool is available to anyone to use. It can be downloaded by going to the North Slope Science Initiative website. And once you get to the page, you'll see that there's two options. The first option of the tool is at the bottom. It's called CS Toolkit. That one was done in Python 3.6 and is not the best version of the tool to use. Use the one that says ArcGIS Pro Python 3.7. The initial run of the tool used raster throughout and was more time consuming and required um, a third party open source tool library, whereas this one um, was refactored by Aaron Helton and is much more streamlined and was done in Python 3.7. So this is available for anyone to download and use. And the big picture is that, let me see if I can move this. Uh, band. Are you guys seeing a band that has all of the mute and start video things on there? Yep. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. Oh, well, I don't think I can move it. So the big picture is that this tool can be used to identify the best locations for any business need for any location on the globe. Whether or not your project is to identify locations for road construction, pipeline right away, wind turbines, building location, underground utilities, water locations, or well locations, the tool can be used based on the structure of what it does. So the multi-criteria decision-making analysis and weighted decision matrix require that criteria are identified for the problem and each of the criteria are assigned a cost. These are all applied to the different GIS layers. And then the criteria are combined into similar categories. So you can see, for example, if you have subcategories, they might include things like wetlands and threatened endangered species. And these will all roll up into larger primary categories. The categories can be anything that you define them to be, as well as the subcategories and the criteria that are used to um, input the factors that will change the outcome of the suitability analysis. These categories are assigned by subject matter experts or assigned a weight by subject matter experts. And we identified that it was very important to work closely with the business and subject matter experts to have them define that information. Additionally, the tool allows any user to, to use publicly available data or also incorporate their own proprietary data. So that was very important for the state of Alaska to do so that the tool puts the analytical capabilities and the ability to establish those criteria and input layers into the hands of the business and is not um, inferring any bias or um, preferred data sets on the users of the tool. So any of this can be predefined by the subject matter experts. So the end result, once you take and you use tool one, will develop the workspace. Tools two and three assign a relative cost and vector, a relative cost to the vector and raster data sets. Tool four combines the cost layers. Tool five creates the final cost raster. And tool six creates the least cost path. And all of this is done and packaged up into a structured workspace environment so that there's logging and auditability and reusability for all of the criteria. And the end result is a cost surface where red equals areas of avoidance and green equals favorable areas for your site selection. So what this does is it makes it so that modifications to the criteria and weight are easily applied for alternatives analysis. For example, this line on the left was one of our first runs. And with working with the client, they determined that 
this was not accurately accommodating the slope and um, information on the coastline that they want to avoid. So we added a two meter Arctic DEM and implemented a stop at this gas field. And in the end, it changed the route significantly to more accommodate an alternative that would um, account for the slope of the, of the region. So the system requirements for the tool, it's an Esri based product. So um, you have to have Esri ArcGIS Pro 2.5 or greater with the spatial analyst extension. We would recommend that if you want to use the tool that you include a GIS analyst to run the tool. It's, it is a GIS tool, so it's not always intuitive for any user to use. Um, we felt that project management was nice to keep uh, the GIS analyst and the business stakeholders connected and the information flowing. Um, the business stakeholders are necessary to inform those criteria and layers of favorability and least favorability. And then the subject matters are more of like the scientific experts who can help understanding what surface area is um, most beneficial or what those areas of avoidance are going to look like. And then the advantages of using this tool as opposed to the um, processes that you might use if you're just going through and using all of the desktop tools individually is that this has an established framework and approach. So the methodology has been developed and fine tuned. The data is packaged up into a nice um, um, construction of different geo databases with audit logs and outputs and scratch data sets so that you can reuse information and you don't have to rerun everything from scratch if you decide to change and make an alternative. And then we've also incorporated a vision document and a training video to walk through how to use the tool and um, screenshots to um, use when you're trying to implement the tool. So for now, I'm going to hand it off to Erin, and she's going to go through um, more of the technical details about the tool. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Good. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So um, there are some uh, preparation steps uh, that probably need to be done before any uh, project wants to use this tool set. And uh, Tasha's already kind of touched on these a little bit. Uh, first step is, of course, identifying the problem that you need to solve. Um, that could be trying to put in a roadway or wind turbines or a building location. Uh, some, you need to kind of establish what it is that you're hoping to achieve. Um, you have to establish your area of interest. And uh, as Tasha mentioned, it can be anywhere in the world, big or small. This tool converts files quickly to vector rather than keeping them in raster. So it can handle pretty large areas uh, without too much processing time. Um, if we kept them in raster, it, it, it took a very long time to process. So uh, that was a choice that we made and it, it allows us to, to uh, um, accommodate really large uh, areas. Um, we also need to determine the site selection criteria and that's uh, where you would work with your subject matter experts and decide what you need to avoid and also what, what areas would be most favorable for what you're trying to accomplish. The next step would be to co collect those GIS data layers, whether they're in-house data layers, publicly published data layers. Um, you need to kind of make, make that effort and go ahead and collect them all into one place, whether it be hydrology, land ownership, habitats, uh, ecological zones, um, whatever you have deemed uh, necessary to determine what to avoid and, and what you prefer. Uh, and then uh, kind of to be your cheat sheet throughout the workflow is to prepare yourself a data prep table. And that's uh, which, where you'll, you'll have all of your uh, criteria layers and all the costs associated with them. So you can refer back to those as you work through the tool set. So here's our a hypothetical problem to kind of, or hypothetical situation to kind of walk everybody through. So step one would be to identify the problem. Um, in this case, it's needing to find the best route for a permanent road connecting three uh, remote villages from one point to another. Uh, we had to choose an area of interest and that's the area we have drawn out here in red. We have uh, determined, we have to determine the site selection criteria. And so we know that we have ground surface is our most important factor here in order to uh, develop a stable road. 
And then, so for sort of step four, uh, we need to collect the GIS data layers. And in this case, we decided on uh, wetlands was one of our primary. I think that was, I think that example, yeah, we have wetlands and uh, different types of wetlands were, uh, gave, were we established different scale values um, in order for different wetland types. And uh, yeah, there's the example of it, what the data prep table might look like where it has your, your data set types, um, if it needs to be buffered or not, um, any attribute queries uh, that would be required to select the particular features in that data set if necessary and the scale associated with them. And if there's any notes, you can also make some notes in there as well. So that would be kind of your, your initial steps to kind of know, know how you wanna tackle your, your initial problem. Okay, so the first step in the tool is to prepare your project workspace. Um, doing this step kind of makes sure that any of the analysis steps that you embark upon stay neat and tidy in your one little project folder. Um, it will create two workspace, or the workspace will have two uh, geodatabases created, an output and a scratch. Um, output, of course, being all of your, your final data sets that will continue getting used throughout the other tool sets and, of course, your final product and, uh, and a Scratch Geodatabase. I like to keep the Scratch Geodatabase separate rather than having uh, derivative layers kind of disappear into the ether because if you have to go back and do any debugging or have to go look through if something came out the way you didn't quite expect, it gives you that opportunity to look back through that Geodatabase and uh, see where something may have gone wrong or gone different. Um, than you expected. So it gives you the two geodatabases. You'll mostly only be using the output one, but the scratch one is there if there's ever an, a debug requirement. Um, yeah, so next step is um, to add relative costs to your vector data sets. So these are all the data sets that you've downloaded. They're all in different formats. They all have different fields. Um, and so this is where you, you can assign a uh, point to the workspace that you're working in and your project area. Um, and then you add this vector and you can, you can also determine if you need to buffer it in this tool. And then you start applying uh, the costs that uh, you had decided um, were a value based off of the uh, table that you had made previously. Now you have a couple of options. You can assign one cost across all of the features in your vector data set, or you can assign multiple costs. Um, and you can do that through SQL expressions at the bottom um, to match kind of the table how if you had already established certain certain field types to have a certain cost, you can add those um, into the SQL expressions below. Um, I believe there's also an op option where you can just choose a field, um, but uh, the manual way is, is the, probably the, the most customizable way to make sure that you uh, query exactly the, the features that you want and give the cost that you want. And so that, oh, I will mention too, that last tool and this tool here are uh, repeatable. So you would run it um, as many times as you have different features. Um, and so you, you would run this tool each time for each feature or class that you wanna make sure you include. Sorry, I forgot that part. <laughs> so to tool three, now this, this tool I had initially created to automate it in Python, um, but we had to pull back and uh, go back to just instructions from the initial toolbox. We had an issue where uh, Pro, an update we got from Pro um, broke the parameters that are required for the reclassify portion of the Python script. The parameters to configure on the toolbox were no longer playing nicely with the reclassify uh, in the Python. So at this point we did have to uh, just provide instructions on how to do this, this segment uh, just from the toolbox. Um, but the, uh, the instructions are available in the user guide and the steps that used to be completely automated in Python were uh, extract uh, by mask and that being the area of interest. Um, the reclassify tool, which had the, the parameters that weren't playing, playing nicely. Um, that's the reclassify tool um, and, it, and it gives you an interactive um, a view where you can choose which cell values need to be reclassified to new cell value or your cost values. Um, and you can either do it by integer, just IDing a value and giving it a new value, or you can also specify ranges and, and specify a range needing to be assigned a new cost value. Uh, then it uh, converts the raster to polygon. As I mentioned, this, this tool set uh, works in vector land, not in raster land to keep processing uh, most efficient. And, uh, and then, of course, a couple of final steps just to prepare those relative cost fields to be standardized with all of your other vector data sets that you had created in the previous step. Okay. 
There we go. Okay. So this step tool four, combine cost layers. This is where you can aggregate uh, feature classes that are all from one category. Now this step is kind of optional, depending on the types of data sets that you're using, you may not need to combine your cost layers. If you have a lot of different types from different categories and, and, and you want to give each of those their own unique weight. Um, the reason why we get out of this step, um, the example that we have on here is we had uh, camps and allotments as two separate feature classes. Um, and we wanted to be able to, if, if for example, if, if you have two features, let's, let's say you have two ecological zones and one of them is a zone is, is you want, you've weighted it as three and you've weighted the other one as five and they overlap. Um, if you want your, rather than giving them each a separate weight, um, this gives you the opportunity to kind of merge them and choose either the highest or the lowest cost and have that value kind of trump the other ones. Um, so that allows you to kind of to, to, to merge them all into one feature class uh, and, then, and then you'll end up assigning that one feature class a single weight. Um, but that it just gives you an opportunity to kind of have multiple features that are maybe or, or yeah, areas that are strewn across multiple feature classes and you want them all to kind of be merged into one feature class before you move on. Um, this gives you that opportunity to do that. And then you can have um, the cost, uh, have, have your costs trumped by either the maximum or the minimum values. And then the fine, uh, fi final step to get your cost raster is to combine all of your category layers, or if you didn't merge them into, or combine them, then just your, your layers um, into the cost raster using a weighted overlay. And this is all your final weights that you had established in your table, um, your cheat sheet. And that's, it's pretty straightforward. You input all the layers that you've now standardized through the last uh, two or three steps and uh, you apply the weights and you can, again, you can change these. If you've decided you wanna run it again and try tweaking those values, you can run it again um, as many times as necessary to kind of get a, a visual feel of how, how these weights are changing your outputs. And I will also point out um, that the weighting is always relative to the sum of all of the values you've put in there. It does not automatically assume that it's hundred out of a hundred. It does not automatically assume it's out of five. It is not, it, what it will end up doing is it'll actually take the sum of all of the numbers that you've put in those weight values and then make everything relative to that. So if instead of wanting to come up with values that all equal hundred, if you wanted to just put one, one, two, three, two, and say, you know, I want this one to be worth three times as much as the other ones, um, you can do that as well. And the weights will still become relative to how you put them in. So um, it's pretty, it, it means if you don't quite add up to hundred, your numbers are still, your weights will still come out um, correctly. It's always relative to the total sum of all of the weight values that you've put in there. And yeah, so that's the output that comes out, as she said, and in our case, we were looking for least cost. So in this case, uh, there are green, our green is our lower numbers and our red are our higher values of least desirable. And uh, you can also establish your cell size um, if you have uh, any resolution concerns or data processing concerns for the final result, um, you can change that as necessary. And then this final tool, uh, this one again is kind of optional if you're not doing a, a path, pro a problem that requires a path, um, you could stop at step five. Um, but if you wanted to do step six, this actually gives you the, the least cost path and uh, this is a common uh, tool that's in the ArcMap toolbox. And uh, we've just, again, just standardized it to work with the workspace and, and uh, the final cost layers that we've been producing. And um, so, yeah, you just input, input your final cost layer and the places that you need to connect. Um, and it produces that least cost path for you based off of all of the criteria that you had pro uh, processed in the previous steps. And, and that's what we have for the show. <laughs> uh, thank you, Erin. And as I mentioned, the tool is available to, uh, for anyone to use. The state of Alaska made it publicly available. And then resource data is also available to help if uh, anybody wants help running analysis for their own site selection needs. Are there any questions? Hi, oh, yeah, this is Terry. Um, I, uh, I thought this was amazing. Have you considered uh, customizing this to and pitching it to other clients as well? Um, we 
are certainly able to customize it and pitch it to other clients and um, and so yeah there's certainly a lot that can be done as far as customization and then the fact that it is so open makes it available for anyone to use so um, it's really something that I think could provide a lot of value to a lot of people for sure thanks Um, so I had a question. Uh, this is Phil. Uh, so can anyone run the tool um, or is a GIS professional required to use it? Um, I would suggest that someone with some familiarity with ArcGIS Pro you, runs the tool. Um, like we said, there is a minimum requirement that the person has um, ArcGIS Pro 2.5 or greater, and also the spatial analyst extension. And um, so some familiarity with using um, Esri tools is, is a necessary. Um, this is Ravi. I have a quick question. Excellent presentation, by the way. Excellent presentation. Thank you. LIDAR data, was it used? Number one question. I'm going to be just making three questions. Sure. LIDAR data, was it used? What is the must-have GIS layers in order to make this analysis happen. You have to have those GIS layers without which you cannot get this uh, analysis done. And the last, uh, last question is, was there a slope aspect ratio applied here, direction of the slope towards the, you know, the Arctic Ocean? Is it like just taken for granted? It's just perpendicular to that blue line and that's it, that's the slope. Or is it an orientation to the slope? That's what I meant by an aspect. Thank you, okay. I've taken too much of your time. Oh no, you're fine. Uh, so Ravi, LIDAR was not used in this specific analysis that we did. LIDAR can be used. You would convert it to a, a vector. So mm -hmm. if you have LIDAR that you're interested in using, you need to understand what are the elements of it that you want. Do you want the, um, the point classification data could be used? or you could determine to use the elevation data from your LIDAR or your last files if you wanted to. So um, it depends on what is important about the LIDAR data and uh, your suitability for site selection. So if it was elevation or the um, classifications that would determine if you um, used it. And then your second question is how was the slope used? I think um, so for us, we took the DEM and can classified it to use the slope and we did slope classification on a scale of one to or zero to five and then the zero to five determined the least so the percentage of slope was used to determine the favorable and least favorable location so they wanted yeah. the slope to be less favorable for routing this road okay so no aspect was used that is direction no aspect ratio was used over here that's no. correct okay last but not the least of course the number of gis data layers that you have to have in order to for this program to work you know the analyses that we did were predefined by the subject matter experts we used. So we had subject matter experts from engineering, uh, eco ecology, um, uh, subsistence, so some like sociocultural and economic subject matter experts that we talked to to determine those locations. So um, all of the analyses that we did had upwards of 10 GIS data sets. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other right. questions? And um, like Aaron said, the least cost path piece is optional. So if you had to do a, just a single uh, location for like a building site selection, or you guys had talked about um, some of the suitability that you might need using angle of sun or wind direction, all of those can be GIS data layers as inputs to an analysis in this tool. So those are, are all on, on the table for potential 
analytics that can be done with this tool. All right. Well, uh, Aaron and Tasha, that was an excellent talk. Indeed, very informative. Um, thank you so much for uh, putting it together. And uh, we appreciate you uh, coming out in, in support of the uh, Houston Pug. So folks, this concludes our Q4 2021 meeting. Thank you, Scott, Todd, Orlando, Tasha and Aaron for these great presentations. And thank you again, Esri, for hosting this event. We have recorded the event and we will be providing a link for it when it becomes available. Uh, if any of you would like to suggest topics for future speaking events, or you would like to offer a talk yourself, please email us at Houston at PugOnline.org. Again, that is Houston at PugOnline.org. I am also going to paste uh, the link for the um, upcoming news about the Pug changes on the LinkedIn page uh, that's coming right now. That's it for us. Thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Phil.